Han Dewan enters the dungeon named Dragon's Nest. Instructed by the Bully Council to clear the entire thing alone, the boy undergoes a life-threatening struggle but eventually comes out on top. Soon, Dewan and his friends get involved with some seniors from the school's dance club, Pi Hui Su and his henchmen. Now, he confronts the supposed boss. Sometime earlier, Ji Hun walks with Min He, remarking how cool it is that she is learning how to dance because of her personality. As the girl blushes, the boy reveals how he wanted to change his meek personality when he was younger and went to an academy to do so. Asking Min He if she has ever heard of auto-suggestion before, Ji Hun remembers someone from his childhood. Complimenting himself and saying stuff like, I am the ruler of the universe, a man confuses the young Ji Hun. Upon the latter's inquiry, the former reveals that expressing one's wishes through words can act as a catalyst to push their body and mind in that direction. Thinking how cool this auto-suggestion is, Ji Hun gets his feelings reciprocated by Min He, excited to try it later. Suddenly, he asks her if there is really nothing going on in the dance club. Even though Min He assures Ji Hun that everything is all good, the girl's lie soon gets exposed. Now, as Ji Hun is about to leave class, he meets one of Min He's worried friends. She reveals that the girl has been continually getting bullied in the dance club and is hiding it, not wanting the people around her to get in trouble. The friend insists that she wanted to protect Min He but was unable to do so, having been ordered around by the seniors, particularly Oh Hei Sun. Despite Min He's wishes to not tell anyone, the friend gets worried for her and ends up spilling to Ji Hun that the girl got called out separately by Hei Sun after the club meeting today. Hearing this, the boy remembers how Min He hasn't responded to his text for a while and furiously clenches his mobile. Meanwhile, Unsung gets on a call with Choi Sun Jae, the affiliate of the Bully Council headquarters. Sitting around a maid cafe, Sun Jae informs the Silim Dong leader about the Nun Hyang Dong members of the Bully Council, the ones who distribute drugs. Having checked their account book, the affiliate found a couple of suspicious things. So he wants En Sung to investigate what the Nun Hyang Dong is up to behind his back. Picking up an empty candy packet from nearby, the Silim Dong leader gets right to it. At the same time, Hei Sun beats down a tied up Min Hei. Grabbing the poor girl by the hair, the senior questions why she still hasn't left the club at this point, even after all the hints these past few days. Min Hei begins to tear up, trying to say something. Suddenly, Hei Sun remarks that she hates the girl's awkward, insecure, and pretty face. Whenever she saw Min, Hei get all the worry, love, and attention from everyone around her. Hei Sun hated her chubby self. She really projecting hard with the insecure comment, ha. Huh. Wishing to be born skinny and pretty like the junior, the senior wanted to feel loved. So she started to use the candy that drops her appetite, making it perfect for dieting. Now Hei Sun is prettier and can get loved too. Or that is what she thought. Because of the addiction to the candy, the senior couldn't stop relying on it. And so, underneath the thick layers of makeup, what remains now is a disgusting skeleton-like face. Blaming her situation and addiction on Min Hei, Hei Sun declares it unfair for this to only happen to her. So, let's do it together, says the latter in a manical manner, trying to force feed the candy to Min Hei. Right then, Ji Hun intervenes and grabs Hei Sun's wrist, making the candy fall on the ground. After confirming that Min Hei is okay for now, he turns over to the senior and inquires what she was trying to do with the girl. Refusing to let go of Hei Sun's wrist in spite of her repeated demands, Ji Hun suddenly gets punched by Jin Won, calling him a bad guy for using his strength against a girl, sending the boy flying. The senior proclaims to utterly crush him. However, Ji Hun gets back in a flash with his Taekwondo and strikes Jin Won with an academy style flying kick. As it gets blocked, the boy quickly follows up using Capoeira martial arts and attacks with Beja Floor, flipping in midair to kick Jin Won's shoulder. While Hei Sun tries to warn her fellow third year about the incoming attacks, Ji Hun continues the onslaught by using his boxing combination. Right then, Jin Won commends him for being so resourceful. However, he still stands unfazed and declares that all those skills won't help Ji Hun win against the sheer weight class difference between them. Get crushed, the buff third year announces, sending the boy flying away with a thunderous punch. While Ji Hun lies on the ground, Hei Sun expresses that she got scared earlier, asking the damsel what she called him over her friend. While Min Hei worriedly shouts out for Ji Hun, the senior tells Jin Won to come over there and help her keep the girl's mouth open. As the rich senior starts walking over there, Min Hei trembles in fear. Just then, Ji Hun gets up and puts his hand against Jin Won's throat. Though his teacher told him not to use it, the boy no longer has any choice. 
stabbing the third year's mech with his fingers. Ji Han reminisces asking his teacher about mind control at the academy. The man remarks that in life there are moments when impulses or emotions take over one's entire being and come out in an aggressive manner. During these moments, it can calm the mind. However, the teacher instructs the child not to use it for the opposite effect. That is, to make one's normal self go wildly crazy. Surely he listens to his teacher, right? Right? As Jean Wan steps back and starts to sweat, Ji Han asks him if he wants to try again. With academy-style mind control, the boy finally lets loose, promising to crush the senior's entire head. Being alive is so boring, this is the feeling that envelops Pete Hoisu. Funny videos, dancing, and even bullying. Everything turned out to be boring for the third year. That is, until they came across the candy and now Doan. Having been in desperate need of a bigger stimulus all this time, Hoisu starts trembling with excitement. This is it, stimulation. Shouts out the manacle senior, pulling his bloodied head out of the floor. Though, Doan is having none of this. Announcing that getting back up like that is a big cliché. He strikes Kuzu down again with a thunderous falcon drop. Doan tells the senior to just stay stuck there and starts moving, thinking that the quest has cleared. However, the prompt that follows is henchman defeated. Baffled at the fact that Pi Hoisu was an underling all along, Doan suddenly receives a call from a restricted caller ID. The person behind the call seems to be aware that Doan is Bora Meidong's rep, declaring it to be the reason for Pi Huaisu's swift defeat. After Doan confirms that the mysterious caller is the true boss, he receives a proposition from the other end. Wanna meet up? Meanwhile, the battle between Ji Hun, who is now in a wild frenzy after using mind control, and the sweating Jin Wan continues. Panicked, Hei Sun shouts out at her fellow third year to fight properly, while Min Hei looks on in pure awe. I just know she in love right now. Enraged, Jean Wan charges at Ji Hun to get him to respect his seniors, but is met with only a grin. During Ji Hun's martial arts training, the Taekwondo instructor insisted that fulfilling one's honor as a martial artist is more important than winning. Getting told to stick to the rules, Ji Hun questions if there is a way to win against someone who's bigger by using this way of martial arts. The instructor remarks that it's difficult, as there are different weight classes for a reason. However, it may be possible by throwing away one's martial honor, something the academy does not teach. Facing a foe much bigger than himself at the moment, Ji Hun throws away against this so-called honor and spits in Jin Wan's eyes. The boy grins at the created opening, striking the senior's neck with a monstrous elbow. Though, the ripped third year refuses to stand the disrespect and counterattacks, declaring that Ji Hun's delinquency has gone too far. He mutters the boy with a grin despite bleeding from his mouth and nose after eating the massive blow. Confused at how Ji Hun can laugh in such a position, Ji Wan looks to finish him off once and for all. What the senior doesn't know is that this laughter is a prelude to his opponent throwing away all semblance of morals, shame, and guilt, things that control a person from not crossing the line. And so, Ji Hun puts his fingers inside Ji Wan's mouth and clutches the outer part with his thumb, ruthlessly pulling away at the third year's jaw with a swift motion. Ouch that got hurt. In the past, rules and morals didn't exist. Countless battles were fought for nothing but survival, the need for which has been ingrained into the very DNA of humans, using mind control on himself to go into a wild frenzy. Ji Hun released all the things that held back his combat prowess, crossing the line a modern man would never dare to in a fight. Unleashing on Jin Wan, he fulfills his promise to crush the senior's entire head and rips him a new one with a monstrous headbutt. To top it off, Ji Hun kicks away the bloody body right into the screaming Hei Sun, shutting her up for good as well. See, I won, remarks the boy, as his manacle grin slowly turns back to a gentle smile. Min Hei can't believe what she just witnessed, as Ji Hun rushes to untie her. Meanwhile, Da Wan arrives at the lair of the true boss and wonders why bad guys must always hide in dark places like it. Moments later, he comes across a cloth-covered body-like silhouette, pulling away the cloth to see if it's a person. Dawan instead finds a mannequin with a red X mark across its forehead. Suddenly, a liquid starts spraying out of the X's center, drenching the confused boy. LX7 announces a voice from the shadows, revealing it to be a drug ten times stronger and more addictive than the candy. Dawan is left in shock, as the mystery boss is none other than the feeble caretaker guy who warned him of Hozu's danger. To him, hiding behind people and commanding them to do things feels a lot better than being directly involved. Doan's body starts to shiver, as the boss declares that he will bake him for drugs, just like all the others. 
As the boy's vision starts to get wiggly, the mastermind promises to give him all the drugs he wants. Of course, only if Dewan obeys him. Also, none hang down in the bully council, says the boss, trailing off after seeing the junior fall to the floor. Walking away, the mastermind tells the unconscious Dewan to have sweet dreams as reality will not be kind to him after waking up. Right then, the boy gets right back up and shakes himself off. Having been surprised, he thought something was going to happen, but is now unfazed. Unable to believe that Doan is completely sober, the panicked boss is confused at how he did it. This was the hidden skill that Doan had obtained after defeating Choi Juryon. Circulation of light, immediately nullifying all abnormal conditions, excluding diseases and physical injuries. With his entire body brimming with a bright glow, Doan presses the boss about mentioning Nun Hyang Dong and questions if he is affiliated with the bully council. Though it doesn't matter to the boy either way. What's important to Dewan is that this is the last one. As he marches on towards the boss, the chain quest's finale reveals danger and prompts to defeat him. Continuing to get bullied by people like Huizu every day, the mastermind only wishes of death. And so, he decides to follow through and prepares to hang himself. However, the feeble guy gets scared and doesn't have the courage to go out in such a painful manner. In pursuit of a painless day to die, he ends up discovering the candy on a dark website, realizing that it's instead his way to not die. Now, the mastermind stands against an enraged Doan, charging at him to finish things off once and for all. Not wanting to waste any time, the Boro Maidong rep prepares to punch the boss. Suddenly, a puppy comes running there and jumps between the two. Caught off guard, Doan retracts his punch. While the boy looks on in confusion, the mastermind picks up the puppy, calling it Ross. Remarking that Ross hates to be alone after being abandoned by his past owner, the boss asks the junior if he knows what obedience training is. Just like a dog is made aware of a hierarchy, so that it obeys its owner's commands, humans work the same way. For the weak to obey the strong, the latter use the obedience training technique of bullying at school. The mastermind wonders if there's any way for the opposite scenario to work, to make the strong obedient. Of course there is. You reward them, proclaims the senior. Reminiscing the time he approached Huizu to hand him the candy. Obedience is always followed by a reward. The mastermind used this addictiveness of candy to teach the bullies of that order. With this, he obtained Ross from Huizu by promising to give him more candy, making the dance club's vice president first of his many henchmen at school. Lib really said to work smarter and not harder. Hearing the senior's story, Doan calls him a pervert who likes to play the owner. Well, maybe. The mastermind snarks, pulling out a whistle. Remarking that he is aware of Dewan's strength, the boss announces that it's only when his opponent is a human. A horde of dogs emerges from the shadows, having been trained to attack anything and anyone that the mastermind points to. Feeling conflicted that it's gotten to the point of having to fight dogs now, Dewan declares in advance that this isn't going to be animal abuse. Activating his speed booster, the boy runs around the battlefield and knocks the dogs unconscious one by one, albeit getting hit by a non-lethal bite. Doan makes quick work of the waves of the countless beasts. At the end of his booster, only one dog remains, the most dangerous looking one. Being a muscular unit of a beast, the dog snarls at Doan. Though, it's made quick work of, and the boy ties it up using his hood's strings. Turning over his attention back to the mastermind, Doan inquires if he has anything more prepared. If you don't, it's my turn now, warns the Bora Maidan while the mastermind cowers in fear. Ross tries to comfort him, but the frustrated boss throws the poor puppy on the ground, not wanting anything to do with the useless dog at the moment. Reprimanding the mastermind for taking out his anger on an innocent puppy, Doan goes to check up on the creature. Seeing this, the boss starts running away, hurling empty threats at the junior. Right then, he trips up on the mannequin from earlier and gets sprayed by the LX7 drug. Wiggling around pathetically, the mastermind vows to make everyone obey. Enough with the bullshit proclaims Dewan, towering over the boss. Under the effects of the potent drug combined with his fear, the mastermind sees a distorted image of Dewan as the devil himself. This is top one Raw's performances of all time. Dishing out a swift beating to the boss, Dewan instructs him to remember it, promising to feed the mastermind with this instead of candy if he tries anything weird at school again. As the senior goes flying, the chain quest finally completes. Right then, Unsung arrives and gets asked by Dewan why he is there. Understanding that the boy has already gotten involved in the matter, a Silim Dong leader reveals that there's a traitor in the bully council behind the mastermind. So, Unsung needs Doan's cooperation to root out the traitor and fight together, Silim and Borome. 
Suspicious activity was already happening within the bully council, and now the situation with Doan happens, convincing Unsung that it can't be a coincidence. Hearing this, the boy remembers what he heard from the boss earlier and asks the Silim Dong rep if he is talking about Nun Hang Dong. Unsung confirms it to be the case, expressing that something is different this time around even though the conflict between members of the bully council is a natural phenomenon. The man reminds Do Wan that the path he chose was taking on some of Silim Dong's tasks instead of raising money for the bully council. Unsung warns the boy that he or someone close to him could get seriously hurt because of it, announcing that he will be taking the mastermind to get information. Suddenly, a smoke bomb comes flying into the enclosed space and erupts. Using the confusion caused by the crimson smoke spreading everywhere, a mysterious figure in biker's suit shows up on a bike. He picks up the unconscious mastermind, telling the headquarter dogs that the plan has already started. Unsung is confused by what that means, receiving a warning. Just wait patiently until we go to you. With this, the mystery man rides his bike out of there with an immense speed, leaving the two reps in the dust. Doan is annoyed that the glasses pervert got rescued by someone, while Unsung ponders what the plan is. Sometime later, the mastermind wakes up in an ice water bath. Don't make me wait. Calls out a voice suddenly, instructing the senior that it's always his job to wait. This is none other than Kim Ho Seong, the distinguished representative of Nun Hang Dong. These bullies be dressing up like they presidents or something, while the mastermind trembles in fear. Ho Seong questions if it was really that hard to train a single headquarter dog. The pathetic senior insists that it's because the drug didn't work on him. Getting told to shut up as a loser's excuse is unconvincing. Having wanted to get to the Bora Meidong rep before the plan started, Ho Seong declares that the senior will be getting no more candy starting today. Shouting at the Nun Hang Dong rep to wait, the glasses pervert pathetically begs to be given one more chance. However, this ends up only infuriating Ho Seong, who frowns upon the mastermind for daring to make requests to him. Announcing that he will always be the one who makes the requests, the distinguished tells the senior that acting like the boss at his school must have made him forget his real self. Instructing the man in the biker's suit to help him remember, Ho Seon walks out of the room, leaving behind an echo chamber of screams. Afterwards, Arin cries and embraces Min Hae. The former complains why the latter didn't tell her anything, even though she told her to. Min Hae calms down her friend, remarking that nothing bad happened in the end as Ji Hun saved her not being aware of Ji Hun being good at fighting as well. Arin inquires how he was. Memories of the altercation start flowing back to Min Hae, making her tremble. However, she starts blushing instead and turns completely red, remarking that Ji Hun was scarily cool. Yep, she in love love. While Arin teases her friend to elaborate, Minhoan looks at them from the school window with a smug look. Ji Hun approaches him and asks what he is doing, getting teased by his friend in return. Doan then expresses how good it is that things got solved in the end, since the Pete Hui Su trio left the dance club, and the glasses pervert doesn't show up to school anymore either. However, even while saying that, Doan wonders what the plan is the biker guy mentioned earlier. Elsewhere in a theater, an ominous figure remarks that things are moving faster than they planned and expresses how it would have been better if they had more time to do it slowly. This is the Naxiang Dae Dong representative, Steven Ziegel. If only Suan Dong wasn't eliminated quickly, says the mixed guy, looking towards another man sitting a few seats from him. Are you saying it's my fault? Questions Kong Ingong in return, who is the ex-representative of Suan Dong. Suddenly, another guy, Che Jin Ho, also an ex-representative of Suan Dong, chimes in and says to not be like that. Especially since Suan Dong sacrificed their business and burned it in flames in order to prevent the documents related to the plan from going into the bully council's hands. A loser's sacrifice is worthless, declares Kim Ho Seong in return. Amongst all the bickering, the Jo Won Dong representative, namely Yu Jun Jin, just yawns and says the weather is nice. Suddenly, a flamboyant voice announces that there is no need to argue amongst themselves and asks if no one else is excited for the bully council's future, breaking a Rubik's Cube instead of solving it. This is the Mi Seong Dong representative, Stan Moon. Hearing this, a mysterious figure grins from the shadows. He proclaims that they are going to have only one ending. Since their plan is picking up speed, the Guanaku Bully Council will fall apart in the near future. As the projector begins to roll the film, the mysterious man with a tattooed hand announces that it's time to start the Bully Council's Kudeta. Unsung stands with Do Wan, wondering what the biker guy meant when he said we that day. At first, 
His Silim Dong rep's mind goes to the Nun Hang Dong, but he doesn't want to deny the possibility that the man may have been referring to another group. Unsun looks back on the time when Siwon Dong burned down the agency in order to hide something, expressing that it also bothers him. While the Silim Dong continues to hypothesize the link between the two situations, Wan just nods along, feeling overwhelmed by the mind-numbing conundrum. Just then, Unsung remarks that Bora Meidong doesn't have a lot of manpower, so there will be some difficulties completing this task alone. So he wants Dewan to use the two Silim Dong affiliated guys that are in charge of surveillance, Shin Jae Min and Yuk Man Chun. While Unsung tells the boy that it will be easier since they have all met each other before, the involved parties seem to be uncomfortable, considering the two guys tried to bully Dewan before getting humbled by him. Shaking in his boots, Jae Min sweats even while greeting the boy. Manchun follows suit, apologizing for last time. Suddenly, Dewan shouts out that it's so nice to see them again and grabs the two Silimdong info agents by the necks like they are best pals. Oh, he about to do something devious to them. Confirming with Unsun that he can use them however he wants during a situation, Dewan lets out a grin. Let's have fun together, remarks the Bora Meidong representative in a sinister manner. Afterwards, News begins to spread around in the school about Dewan beating up Pete Hui Su's gang from the dance club. At the lunch table, some students wonder if the rumor about the second year becoming an officer of the bully council is true. One of them chimes in, declaring that there is no way of the game shuttle loser being someone so high profile. Once a loser, always a loose. He trails off, getting told to watch his mouth by Irene. The girl tells the group that Dewan isn't a loser and that he is most definitely not a bully. Heading away from the apologizing students who wonder if she is friends with Do Wan, Arin goes to sit with Min Hei. The latter remarks how it's not like the former's usual self to get so worked up, questioning if it's because of Do Wan. Blushing at first, Arin replies that it's not because of the boy but due to the fact that they are gossiping behind someone's back. Suddenly, a group of girls sitting nearby starts to talk about how handsome Do Wan looks nowadays and thirsts over him. Hearing others expressing their desire to date the boy, Irene gets flustered and drops some food on her uniform. Seeing the girl start to stutter over her words, Minhei smiles, telling Irene that she is bothered by him after all. Meanwhile, Doan is having lunch with Siyum in a packed restaurant. Unable to believe his eyes, he asks the girl if the people there are all actual customers. The boy questions if the problem was the previous location or the taste of the Tupbo Key, getting told that it's neither. What's actually happening is the entire place is filled with girls, crushing over a handsome server with rose-colored hair, apologizing to Doan and Si Yun for being late. The man comes to sit with them, being none other than Si He, barely recognizing the man's new appearance. Doan then asks Si Yun about Kang Si Hoon. The girl reveals that he isn't coming today, having gone off to train or something. Hearing this, Doan remembers that Kang wanted to go on a journey to get stronger. Unable to believe that the crazy guy was actually serious, Si Yuman continues the conversation and asks the boy what he wanted to tell them anyways. Having mentioned a bit about it on the phone earlier, Doan reveals that Bora Meidong will be fighting with Silim Dong from now on. Si He concludes that this means another traitor besides Si Wan Dong has appeared, getting told by the boy that they don't know what will happen this time even though that's the case. So, Doan wants to remind them all about one thing, to be careful and not get hurt. Though, his cool speech gets interrupted by his friends mentioning that those are two things. Bra's really nitpicking everything. Leave the guy alone. Siyu inquires if there's anything they should do, upon which Doan tells the two to stay the way they are. The boy is convinced that things should be enough with just him at the moment. Meanwhile, Kim ho Seong reads a newspaper and asks the drug manufacturer, Profit Model, about the progress. Hearing that it is nearly complete, the Nun Hyang Dong rep orders the latter to finish it and then looks at his watch. Seeing the time, Ho Seong announces that it's almost the start of the Guanaku Bully Council's destruction. Over with Do Wan, he arrives at Nun Hyang Dong's hideout along with Unsung. The Silim Dong rep remarks that they will first secure the place and then find out the evidence of betrayal as well as details about the plan. Unsung tells Do Wan not to say that he didn't warn him about getting hurt, though the boy already knows that to be the case but not doing anything and letting them make the first move would cause the people around him to get hurt. With the flip of a switch, Doan starts making jokes about breaking into the hideout like they do in movies, making unsung remark that he has definitely changed from the past to be doing such a thing in this situation. Walking ahead of the Silim Dong representative, a serious Doan mutters, really, I can't tell. 
Kim Ho Seong reads the newspaper, getting asked by someone if he isn't nervous at all to be doing such a thing in this situation. Nervous? No way, proclaims the Nun Hyang Dong representative, asking the mysterious man if it isn't the same for him too. Maybe, mutters the entity with a monstrous tattoo on his hand. Announcing that their plan is really starting from now, he questions Ho Seong if he is sure about not regretting her choice to betray the bully council. This agitates the Nun Hyang Dong rep, who reiterates that there is no way for that to happen. Putting down the newspaper, he laments that the current bully council is using order as an excuse to restrain each dong, exploiting the money collected by each profit model. So, Ho Seong refuses to play into their hands any longer. Blood really thinks he is doing something brave with this. Demolish the bully council and obtain freedom. This is what the ominous man proposed after all. Hearing this, the mysterious entity announces that the current bully council members only know that there's a traitor in the organization without knowing the exact number of them. Bowing to dig into the fear that there's an unknown amount of traitors within the organization and the chaos that ensues because of it, he declares to break the bully council. As the man proclaims that the result of this plan will not change no matter what, an X-Factor arrives at the entrance of the Nun Hangdong hideout in the form of Doan. As Unsung doesn't have the key to the door, the boy forces his way through using a falcon drop and demands for the crazy druggies to come out. Though, the place is empty. Looking around to see the mess, Doan concludes that they must have been making some really dangerous stuff in there. Unsung wonders if the Nun Hyangdong members already moved their base, making the boy realize that the enemy isn't a bunch of idiots after all. Since they are probably going to have to start from scratch again, the Silim Dong representative understands that there isn't enough time to just chase Nun Hyangdong, considering there seems to be more traitors than expected. As Unsung expresses concern over how they are going to sniff them out, Dawan suddenly asks him if Naxiang Daedong is also affiliated with the Guanaku Bully Council. Getting it confirmed, the boy tells his senior to keep chasing Nun Hang Dong as he has something else to do that's related to what's happening. Looking at a quest. Elsewhere, Shin Jae-min and Yuk Manchun keep watch over Guanaku's Naxiang Daedong after Dawan instructed them to do so. Earlier, the boy pushes around the two Silim Dong intel agents and mentions that his sharp intuition makes him suspicious of Naxiang Daedong. In the same vein, he questions what the group even does. Dude's got ultra instinct if he making these guesses without knowing anything. Jamin explains that they have a profit model of giving out small loans while targeting teens, having two main strategies in their business methods. Firstly, they charge an insane amount of interest. If the person realizes the scam and refuses to take it from Naxiang Daedong, then the second part of their strategy comes in. They not only force the poor teenagers to take out a loan by threatening to charge them with a major consultation fee, but also earn on their unfair interest by showing the client an example of someone who couldn't repay the loan interest. Over with Unsung, he meets up with Choi Sun Jae, albeit not in a maid cafe, much to the latter's disappointment. Anyways, the Silim Dong representative inquires if the news is true. Unfortunately, it is. After Dewan and Unsung ambushed Nun Hyang Dong's hideout last night, an area of the Wanaku Bully Council got attacked. Of all places, it was one where the current representative is absent, meaning that the enemy is following the wisest strategy to attack the weak spots first. Though, Sun Jae doesn't seem to be worried just yet since he has Unsung on his side and asks about Doan. The Silim Dong rep informs him of the boy being suspicious of something and investigating Naxiang Daedong, where Steven is the representative. Sun Jae remarks that things would get messy if Steven has really betrayed them, being so powerful because he's full of anger. Tick him off, and the battle will start immediately says the affiliate. Meanwhile, Jaemin and Manchun continue to observe the situation when they get alerted by something. Someone knocks on Steven Siegel's car, wanting to get loans. This is none other than Do Wan, looking to complete the quest of cash and rush by borrowing money from the Nak Siang Daedong representative. The prior night, Do Wan lies in bed, wondering why the random quest of cash and rush appeared out of nowhere, borrowing money from someone he had never met before. The hint of this Steven guy being a traitor was too obvious. Pondering over it, the boy realizes that he has been fighting with numerous bullied ever since joining the bully council. All because of the quests, each situation and its outcome. Everything up until this point has been intended by the system. Doan then poses a question to this mysterious administrator. What are you using me to accomplish? Now the boy arrives before Steven Siebel, asking for a measly loan of 201. The Naxiang Daedong representative wonders if it's some kind of joke, getting assured by Doan that he is serious. Upon hearing this, Steven gets out of the car and towers over the client. 
The rep mysteriously remarks that Doan is ignoring him right now, confusing the latter. Arriving as a second grader at his middle school, Stephen introduces himself as a half-Korean, half-British. Due to his parents' work, he has traveled all around the world since he was young. Stephen thinks that he will be living in Korea from now on, mustering up all this courage to greet his classmates. However, the second grader is met with nothing but laughter. The students that he opened up to not only make fun of Stephen's name, but also declare his way of speaking to be annoying. To make it worse, they project their fantasies of mixed people usually being pretty and handsome onto the poor guy, grinning at him for not being blessed in that area. Now, Stephen grabs Dewan by the collar and announces that he hates being ignored more than anything in the world, so much that he wants to kill them. Don't even blame Bro for being like he is at this point. Hearing this, Do Wan tells the Naxiong Daedong representative that he misspoke about the 201, proclaiming that it's actually 20 million won. The more the merrier. Letting the boy go, Stephen inquires what he plans on using the money and gets told by Do Wan that it's for an internet toto that he got a sure pick on. Seeing the client go on about how Yun 200 million won would be a joke if the 20 million won hits, Stephen reveals that he is aware of Dewan being the representative of the Bora Maidan, questioning the latter why he has come to borrow cash from him and for what reason. The boy tells the mixed guy that his credit isn't so good, so he feels that it's better to borrow from someone he knows, considering they are on the same side. Hearing this, Stephen remarks that they can't lend Dewan that much money since they specialized in small loans. As he starts moving back to his car, the boy wonders if it won't work even with the representative of Bora Maidan as collateral. This wild proposal intrigues Steven. He understands that the places currently connected to the Bully Council headquarters that are in charge of dealing with traitors are Silim Dong and Bora Mei Dong. Nun Hyang Dong knew this and tried to pull Do Wan to their side, albeit failing. Thinking that there is no way that evidence of his betrayal is out there yet, the Naxiang Dae Dong representative looks to get Do Wan under his control, aiming for an even higher position. All of a sudden, Steven becomes eager to lend the money to the client. Confirming Dewan's desire about more being better, the Lung Shark takes out all the money they have at the moment and hands it to him. Stephen hands the massive amount of 50 million won to Dewan, reminding him of the 30% interest rate per day. Jay Min looks on in awe at the interaction between the two reps, remembering Dewan's plan. After the Bora Maidong rep borrows money from Naxiang Daedong, their attention will naturally be drawn to him. The human decoy, Bro is confident, huh? Taking advantage of the weakened security around, the Silim Dong intel agents are to bring him the evidence of betrayal. Jimin worries about the danger in case Dewan can't repay the money, wondering if he has another plan in play. Of course, proclaims the boy, whispering something to Jimin that leaves him in complete shock. One week goes by after the loan, and Steven sits with his fellow to calculate the money Dewan has to repay right now. Including the principal, plus a week's worth of interest, the amount due is 155 million won. Seeing this figure, Steven seems perplexed. He thinks that it's amazing that Doan had the audacity to go off the grid without repaying that much money. For the last three days, the Boro Meidong representative hasn't been responding to their calls either. Infuriated at the boy doing such unnecessary things, the Naxiang Daedong representative vows to do whatever it takes to get it back. No matter what happens, principal, interest, collateral, everything will be theirs. Elsewhere, a man with a burned scar across his neck arrives at Doan's house. Backed by a group of bullies, this is Lee Jin Young, deputy representative of Naxiang Daedong. Suddenly, the intruders get confronted by a man who inquires what they are doing at his brother's house. The bullies question who he is, hearing the guy remark that their tepbo key is quite sweet and anyone can enjoy it without preference. Not knowing what the man is talking about, the bullies approach him, getting choked out. Announcing that he will switch to the spicy side from now on, See he lets loose on the battlefield. Dude is so cool, man. Meeting with Siyun and See he, Doan tells them to be careful and avoid danger, instructing them to just stay the way they are now. Proclaiming that he alone is enough for now, Doan gets labeled a buzzkill by the girl. Siyun scolds him for acting so smug on his own, since Bora Meidong isn't as weak as he thinks. Panicking over this, Doan tries to say that it's not what he meant and gets told that they are not the ones he needs to protect. See, he chimes in to do his best as well, announcing that he can't let his brother carry everything by himself. As Dewan gets moved by this, Steedy talks about doing it for Kong Sihun as well, who is watching from afar. Telling him to not talk like their friend's dead, the Bora Meidong representative asks Si he if he's okay with the fact that it might be hard to avoid a fight. Even though the guy doesn't like to fight, 
All this is for his brother and sister. Ultimately, it's to protect himself as well. Surely, they would have told me to fight back. Even grandfather, who's watching from afar, proclaims, See, once again talking like the man is dead. He then requests for Do Wan to do something, to not get hurt. Now Li Jin Young sees his underlings get choked out by the Bora Meidong member, remarking that this is tough since he isn't good with spicy food. Preferring another hot taste profile personally, he commands the group to finish this quickly as they need to catch the leader soon. Surrounded by enemies and unfazed, see he issues them his first and last warning. If they back down now, he will just let them go, just oozing Giga Chad energy. However, his offer is refused, left with no choice but to fight to protect the ones he loves, see he begins pummeling the attackers. The bullies continue coming in waves calling the Bora member cheesy for his lines. Is it? Wonders see he announcing that he rather likes that part as it's more appealing to him. Dishing out as much punishment to Lee's underlings as his cheesy lines, Stee He leaves the bullies calling for their papas. Naxion Daedong's deputy looks on, intrigued at Stee He finding his own quirks appealing. At his high school, he was ostracized because of the burn scar on his neck. Just for being different, he was unable to fit into a group, becoming a target of ridicule and mockery. Being alone day in and day out, Lee comes across Steven. Instead of being embarrassed by his way of speaking or his face, the Naxiang Daedong ruthlessly beat down anyone who dared to ignore or mock him. Thinking this sight to be appealing, Lee asks Steven where he learned to fight. Turns out, the latter never really learned formally and picked it up naturally while living abroad, where discrimination is much worse. Learning that Lee has never fought before, Steven tells him to use a weapon as that's the easiest way. He reveals that even students carry guns in the US, so it's no big deal at all. As Lee picks out a weapon for himself, Steven wonders if he is really going to be using that as one, making the Naxiang Daedong deputy representative question if it's bad. Though, Steven only means that it suits him well, delighting Lee in his choice. Seeing Seihi tower over his entire group of underlings while embracing his quirkiness at the moment, Lee charges at him. Barely missing his target, the attacker announces what a waste it is as he was about to burn his skin. Feeling the weird sensation pass by him, See, he is left confused at the weapon that was used. Questioning about it, he finds Lee's choice of weapon to be a soldering iron. Yep, this man is a complete weirdo. I told you, I like it hot, proclaims Lee, swinging at See, he with the fiery equipment. Getting scarred left and right, the Bora Meidong member gets mocked by his enemy. Suddenly overcome with a menacing aura, See, he becomes enraged and says, this is really burning up, isn't it? Meanwhile, at the Naxiang Daedong office of the underground parking lot, Steven instructs his underling to get ready for the repossession operation once the deputy brings back Do Wan. In case Lee fails, the rep vows to do it himself. Right then, the Bora Meidong representative arrives before Steven, holding a bag supposedly full of money. He wishes to pay back the money. The Naxiang Daedong representative believes that it's impossible to repay that huge amount and looks through the bag, finding internet coupons inside. Suddenly, Do Wan punches through the bag and strikes Steven getting his attack blocked, getting asked what this means. The boy announces that it's time to fight. The linked quest, cash and hit begins having the goal to defeat Naxiang Daedong's leader, Steven Siegel. Having gotten away with his ruthless business practices by exploiting students all this time, Steven Siegel finally gets confronted by someone unwilling to take it lying down. Blocking Doan's fist, the Naxiang Daedong representative confirms that he doesn't intend on paying back the money. He questions Do Wan if he didn't think about how coming to fight like this might become a problem within the bully council, getting told that there is no need to worry about that. After all, Steven has already betrayed them. Caught off guard, the lone shark questions the grounds of the claim. Testing the waters, Do Wan questions if he really has to spell it out for him. Steven declares the boy's statement to be nonsense, kicking him away. As Do Wan's feet drag across the ground, the Naxiang Daedong representative instructs his underling to head to the office and retrieve important documents, not knowing what Dewan is up to. Steven vows to collect the borrowed money and the collateral, no matter what it takes or what he has to do. Sure, buddy, keep telling yourself that. Looking at his cash and hit quest, Dewan tells his foe that it won't be easy. After all, he too must to knock him down no matter what it takes. Charging forward, the Bora Meidong representative swings at Steven. The lone shark blocks the bow with his arms, complimenting how heavy it is. In a flash, Doan redirects the punch through the gap below Steven's arms, catching him right in the jaw. As Doan brags about his strike being quite substantial, his foe remarks that it's just good enough for its size. 
The Naxian Daedong rep then swings at the boy with a massive kick, sending him flying into a nearby car despite his best attempt at a block. Towering over Do Wan, Steven declares that his long limbs give him an advantage during this fight. Getting up, the Bora Maedong mockingly comments that he's so jealous of him, all the while cooking up a counterattack to exploit his weaknesses. Do Wan realizes that despite Steven's physical advantage, he can land a blow by getting within his fast swing radius. However, the point of Steven's statement isn't about the physical traits, but rather experience. Neem Do Wan in the chest, the Maxiong Daedong rep remembers his time in America. The racial discrimination there was severe, of Steven being labeled a monkey and put down for looking different. Not only in the US, but he had a similar experience while staying in other countries. Never ever be ignored, fight back. This is the conclusion that Steven came to back then. Having traveled many countries, he faced various people, continuously gaining experience and learning from it. Win or lose. While dodging all of Dewan's attacks, Steven continues to pummel him. Compared to those foreign countries, the fights between Korean teenagers are like child's play to the man. Declaring that he has only ever shot a gun in the game, the mixed guy then sends the Bora Maedong rep flying with a massive uppercut. Du really got knocked into the next weekend. Having dominated most of the fight, Steven asks his opponent if it's clear now why he is the representative of Naxiong Daedong. Just now, you were talking about games, right? Questions Do Wan suddenly. Declaring that he has accumulated quite a bit of experience himself, the boy launches his counterattack with a thunderous blind spot strike. A combo of multi strike destruction follows, leaving Steven with blood spilling out of his mouth and nose. Leaping into the air, Do Wan prepares to finish off his foe with a falcon drop. Despite not expecting this, Steven announces that his experience is superior and grabs the Bora Maedong rep's leg to cancel this skill activation. No, it seems I am the superior one, remarks Do Wan. Hanging by a pipe, he switches to putting Steven in a chokehold with his legs, just like kills are done in assassin games. Though, since choking is effective against taller opponents anyways, Steven has already experienced it. Standing on the ground or hanging from the pipe, the Naxiong Daedong representative wonders which of them can endure their situation longer. However, Dawan never planned on enduring in the first place. Letting go of the pipe, the boy begins to fall and activates Stun Smash, announcing that this might be Steven's first experience with something like this, even if he has spent a lot of time living abroad. And so, as the move was activated in a falling state, it was enhanced to Stun Slam. Over with Sihi, he is still dodging Lee's attacks, getting called out by him for doing so as he wants to finish this before the soldering iron's battery dies. Assuring the deputy representative that there is no need to worry as they will finish before that, Stihi lands a thunderous punch on his face. That's not it, mutters Lee, claiming that the Bora Maedong member is deliberately stalling. Putting his soldering iron near Sihi's eyes and getting stopped, Lee calls him out for making the seemingly plausible excuse of fighting in order to protect when he actually just enjoys fighting. Dropping his weapon from the hand that C he is grabbing and picking it up by the other, Lee swings but misses him yet again. Kicking his opponent in the face to counter, C he inquires his reason for fighting. In response, Lee simply throws his soldering iron up in the air and blocks the attack from reaching with both his hands, proclaiming that it's probably just a job for him. Ignoring him, C he just looks at the falling weapon and concludes that Lee can't win with such an approach. Stuff like, this is always a red flag. Much to his dismay, the Naxiong Daedong member tricked him by throwing up an e-cigarette. As Lee stabs Sihi's leg with a real soldering iron, the latter desperately kicks away with his other leg. With only one bar of battery left in Lee's weapon and Sihi being exhausted as well, the two decide that it's time to end the fight. Clashing with his enemy, the Bora Maedong member remarks that both of them might have just needed a justification for their actions, a reason to fight. And so Sihi punches through Lee's soldering iron to strike his face, towering over the bloody bully. He reiterates that his reason to fight will always be to protect. And that's it. Back with Do Wan. He activates the stun smash technique while falling down, turning it into a massive stun slam. Turning into a handstand position, his legs with which he has Steven in a chokehold lift the lone shark in the air. After a complete flip, the head of the Naxiong Daedong representative goes crashing into the ground. Do Wan gets up and shakes himself off, looking back at the bloodied Steven. Even in that situation, the experienced bully managed to absorb some of the shock using his arms, albeit the timing being off, damaging him. Steven begins mumbling a bunch of foreign languages, going on about gouging out Do Wan's eyes and then tying him naked to a chair. 
After this, he vows to snap pictures of the Borma Dong Rep in such a condition and spread it to those around him, including his parents. Of course, being the pure Korean that he is, Doan doesn't understand a single word that the mixed guy utters and simply sends him rolling away with a thunderous falcon drop. Walking towards Steven, the boy tells him that he shouldn't be able to fight anymore. Moreover, at this point, the glasses wearing underling that Steven sent to retrieve the documents from the office must have been caught by Jamin and Manchun. Standing over Steven, Dawan declares that it's all over now and there's no way out for him. Still, the Naxiang Daedong representative is defiant, shouting out that he can make a way out if he needs to. Steven hurls the internet tokens that Dawan brought earlier everywhere. He then pulls out the fire extinguisher, letting it rip on the boy. While Dawan tries to get back his senses, he sees that Steven has made a run for the car. Why are you running? Rolling down the window, the Maxion Daedong rep instructs his foe to remember that the interest is still accruing even at this very moment. Promising that he will come back soon to collect it, Steven drives off. Panicked, Doan questions how he is supposed to chase after the car, refusing to let the lung shark escape. At the same time, Steven drifts through the cramped Korean parking lot, crashing into every corner along the way. He vows to not let this end so meaninglessly and soon busts out of the place. However, Dawan has caught up to him using his fast booster. Hugging the car's roof, the boy contemplates how to get inside, deciding to just make a hole through it. A long time ago, Lee and Steven worked together, terrorizing anyone and everyone in their path. The former is convinced that, at this rate, people can't ignore them any longer. Suddenly, Steven tells his partner that not getting ignored doesn't come from only being good at fighting, but also requires one to have money. He has learned a truth from decades of experience. Race, gender, status, and age. All things fall equal in the face of sheer wealth. A year later, Steven sits in his van and hears a knock on the door. Opening it, he welcomes the customer and asks how much he needs, instead meeting a mysterious man. The entity remarks that under the pretense of supporting the revenue model of their affiliates, the Bully Council of Wanak District takes a substantial amount of the profits. He asks Steven if he isn't dissatisfied with this, considering that his greed for money is particularly talked about. Confused, the Naxiang Daedong rep inquires about the man's identity. The latter ignores his question and just wonders if he plans on continuing to pay tributes to the Bully Council. I asked who you are, announces the infuriated Steven. Hearing this, the mystery man smiles and introduces himself late. This was the first time that Steven Siegel rep met the ominous entity, who has a demonic, monstrous tattoo on his hand. Now, the Naxiang Daedong rep drives around desperately, refusing to let it end like this. He thinks that they just have to act quickly now, essentially through him. Calling the mysterious man, Steven informs him of getting ambushed and about his defeat at the hands of Bora Maedong's representative. Bro really snitched on himself. Li Jinyang has also been taken out, meaning that they know something. Remarking that there is a need to respond immediately, Steven wants to head over to him for now. No, proclaims the mysterious guy, telling the Naxion Daedong rep that he doesn't have to come. Expressing his disappointment in Steven, the man simply hangs up on him. Frustrated at how he has been thrown aside, Steven starts smashing things in the car. Right then, he spots a hand outside the window and finds out that it's Doan, preparing to smash a hole in the roof. Hard swerving the car to shake off the persistent tick, Steven bids the boy farewell. Falling through the air, Doan wonders if he is going to die like this on the cold cemented floor, though the sensation that hits his head is instead a soft one. Having gotten extremely lucky in various ways, Doan falls right into Si Yun's chest. Riding her bike, the girl tells him to move aside. Questioning why is hanging on the car's roof instead of walking out the main entrance, Doan maneuvers around the bike to sit behind her and begins explaining, getting met with a never mind. Instructing the boy to hold on tight, Si Yun remarks that it's going to be rough this time too. Steven looks back through his rearview mirror, seeing Doan chase after him on his friend's motorbike. Declaring that it's like trying to catch a whale with a mackerel, the lone shark slams the car sideways, right into the two. Instead of backing down, Si Yun ups to slam the bike back into the car, she crazy. While Steven thinks that the chaser's brains are full of mackerels as well, Doan worries that just chasing after him won't get them anyone. Borrowing Si Yun's helmet from her head, the boy decides that it's time for him to go rough too. Using the helmet, he begins to smash the car window right in Steven's face. Dewan succeeds in breaking the glass and prepares to land the final blow, but the Naxion Daedong rep continues to be persistent. Announcing that they can't catch him with just this, Steven speeds up and gets some distance. 
No matter what you do, it's useless, declares the lone shark, getting shouted at by Del Juan. Look forward, you idiot. These words echo in the air, as Steven's car goes flying out through the road's barricade and crashes into the field below. Doan tells Siyun to stay on her bike and goes to check out the dangerous wreckage, having always seen these things to explode in movies. Right then, another car drives onto the field, alerting Siyun. A mysterious man comes out of it, declaring Steven's desperate attempt to escape to be pitiful. Being a goofball and not hearing these words, Doan thinks that it's a witness who might have a wrong idea about what happened here and begins explaining himself. It's you. Ha Da Wan, representative of Bora Maidong, mutters the mysterious man, all the while approaching the boy's direction. Si Yun looks from afar, wondering the identity of the man heading towards Do Wan. Overcome with a bad feeling, the girl starts rushing towards them, getting stopped by someone announcing that she can't pass. Wearing a black eye patch on his left eye, the guy demands that Si Yun doesn't interfere as he wants to listen to their conversation. Meanwhile, the mysterious entity questions if Steven being driven to this point was because Do Wan is more capable than he thought, or due to the Nak Siang Dae Dong rep being beneath his expectations. While the bloodied Steven gasps for air with his head stuck in the car's airbag, Do Wan asks the mysterious man if he is with him. The latter reveals that they are the Traitor's Alliance formed to bring down the Bully Council, so it's basically a union. Being aware that Do Wan has been following them since Nun Hyang Dong, the man remarks that he is just like a dog obeying its master's orders. He tells the Bora Maidong rep that he is completely in the dark about the relationship between the Guanaku Bully Council and the Sunshine Rest. And also, your father, the man known as Ha Jino. Hearing these words leaves Do Wan utterly stunned. Remarking that he isn't here to fight him today, the mysterious entity turns around, deciding to call it a day here, as no more time can be wasted. Doan shouts at him to wait a moment, wanting to finish their conversation. Suddenly, a gigantic man, who is holding Steven on his shoulder and speaking in singular words, stops the boy. Getting agitated, Doan demands that he lets go but spots Siyun with the eye path guy, controlling himself from doing something rash. At least he is smart. Walking off, the mystery man remarks that there is no need to rush like this. After all, they will have a chance to talk again before long given that Do Wan keeps following him like a dog. With this, the linked quest of cash and hit gets completed. After the guy's car drives off, Si Yun comes to Do Wan and inquires who he was talking to. The Bora Meidong rep reveals that the man, in his own words, is part of the Bully Council's traitor alliance, so he took Steven with him. Si Yun asks Do Wan if there are any injuries, getting told that he is fine. Though, the boy wonders what they are going to do about the car wreckage. After a moan of silence, Si Yun utters one singular word, run. Afterwards, at the illegal loan office of Naxion Dae Dong, a low-ranking bully tries to explain to Do Wan that he is just an insignificant extra that was just doing his job there. He insists on having no idea that their representative was attempting to betray the bully council. Unsung thinks that the underling isn't lying, since the plan would have a higher risk of leaking if the lower ranks knew about it. That's all from me, remarks the Silim Dong leader having been on a call with Choi Sunjay the entire time as well. While Selma holds the phone for Sunjay like a slave, the HQ affiliate thinks how pitiful and sad Steven's situation is. The Naxiang Daedong rep scraped together so much money by exploiting teenagers all this time, only to lose it to the bully council. Meanwhile, Doan has Jaemin and Manchun each hold a call for him as well, with Sunjay and Unsung. He then turns over to Siyun, who is also on the phone with Sihi. Asking how things are with them, the Bora Meidong rep is told that the unconscious Naxiang Daedong deputy rep is with him as he might know something. Though, see, he soon realizes just moments later that Lee took advantage of the momentary distraction and ran off. Getting apologized to, Dewan just smiles and announces that it's okay, given that they have the traitor all figured out. With a thorough scheme of fake loners, the boy has verified that Naxiang Daedong originally received their funds through the Guanak Gu Bully Council headquarters. However, they always moved to a different location whenever the money in the car ran out. So this means that there is a supplier who provides them with funding. Unsum and Sunjay chime in, having sifted out the traders by comparing them with the current status report of the affiliated Guanak Gu neighborhoods. And so, they have a total of five betrayers. Steven Siegel's Naxiang Daedong. Nun Hyang Dong that is represented by Kim Ho Siang, Si Wan Dong being led by Gun Jin Kang, and where Yu Jun Jin is the representative, Jo An Dong. Last of the traders' groups is Mi Siang Dong, where a mother brings strawberries and milk for her son's teacher. 
She remarks that his son Jin always quits quickly whenever he is sent to different academies, but strangely comes home on the day of his private tutoring. While the gorgeous teacher softly nods along, the son shouts at his mom to leave him alone as his exam is approaching. However, behind closed doors, Sung Jin forgets about the lessons and instead grabs the teacher's hand. Do got that harismant. Biting on a strawberry while the girl trembles, the creep says that he will just carry on with the lesson. Doan checks to see what rewards he has gotten from the quest completion, obtaining a legendary golden key. There's also a second reward this time around, being a scattered piece of the seal. Seeing the mythical item, Doan remembers the reward from the previous quest. Towering over the defeated glasses pervert and his hounds, the boy gets a mythical sealed box that needs six scattered pieces to open it. Successfully inserting the piece of the seal into the box, Doan receives a prompt, announcing that five pieces are left. Wondering what this thing is that requires him to go through all this trouble, the Bora Maidong rep is bothered by the mysterious man's earlier statements. He wants to know what the members of the Traders' Alliance meant about the relationship between Sunlight Shelter and the Bully Council. Though, since there is no choice but to keep chasing the snakes for now, Doan takes a nap. The next day, he visits Si Yun's place in broad daylight, meeting the girl messing around with her bike in a tank top and shorts. Doan is desperate to know more about Mi Xiang Dong. Satiating the boy's curiosity, Si Yun starts walking towards him and reveals that the bully group is notorious for seducing the opposite sex. Startled by the girl getting in his face all of a sudden, Doan falls back. Though, Si Yun just picks up a tool and heads back for the motorbike. She reveals that the Mi Xiang Dong members lure women and use them for money via private tutoring. Doan gets confused as this approach for a revenue model of bully council doesn't sound all bad to him. Si Yun then reveals that these tutors are minors and the tutoring is anything but ordinary. Nah, put them in jail. Indulging in the pleasure of using their parents' money, guys like Sun Jin get carried away and are caught by their family. With this, the real purpose of Mi Xiang Dong comes into play, while the mother shouts at Teacher Kim for deceiving her innocent son. The tutor exposes Sung Jin's father doing the same things to her as well, demanding for the money to be transferred. The dad arrives soon after, promising to transfer the money to Teacher Kim if she leaves quickly. Though the damage has already been done and the shocked mother falls unconscious. Leaving the house tired, Teacher Kim meets with Sung Moon, the crimson-haired representative of Mi Xiang Dong. Suddenly, the guy hugs the girl and expresses how touched he is that she would go this far for him. In the same vein, Mu tells Kim that it's okay to stop if she's having a hard time. Blushing, she thanks the rep for worrying about her and vows to continue for his sake. And so, the cruelest aspect of Mi Xiang Dong's crime is the fact that the exploited women are willingly cooperating in the illusion of love. The next day, a meeting is scheduled for Moon with 17-year-old Min Ji Yan. Waiting for him, there is none other than Si Yun having her hair tied up in ponytails and wearing cutesy clothes. The girl is completely flustered, wondering why she has to do this. Earlier, while Si Yun informs Da Wan of Mi Xiang Dong's business practices that start with dating apps, he asks her if she knows of the proverb. If you want to catch a tiger, you have to enter the tiger's den. Albi being aware of what that means, Si Yun can't believe that Da Wan is suggesting something like this. Nah, bro is out of pocket for this, playing the character of little old Princess Minji. She must out Sung Moon's henchmen to eventually get to the representative himself. As Si Yun waits around, she promises to kill Do An after all this is over. Suddenly, Moon approaches her and inquires if she is Minji by any chance. Remarking that she feels different than he thought, the representative leans into her ear and whispers to not do this here. Wanting to go somewhere comfortable. Winning over the mind of the opposite sex and then controlling them psychologically, Mi Xiang Dong's crime is one of sexual exploitation, ruining sex crime. Oftentimes, the victims don't even realize that they are being targeted for a crime. Labeling the Mi Xiang Dong members to be disgustingly loathsome scums, Do Wan wonders how handsome Sun Moon must be to pull off things like this. Sti Yun continues to explain that the group's profit model is similar to the previous one, where all of it is confuted through an overseas-based messenger app to make sure no evidence is left behind. Suddenly, Do Wan suggests for the girl to go into the tiger's den, getting told to get out of her house in a heartbeat. Walking off, the boy guilt trips Si Yun by bringing up that he joined the bully council because of her and has been getting into fights every single day. Da Wan waddles around disappointedly, remarking that he will just figure it out somehow this time as well. Du pulled out the guilt trip card, based. Embarrassed by the little speech, Si Yun agrees to the plan dresses up for the part. Now, Da Wan lurks in the shadows while the girl awaits Moon's arrival. 
He apologizes to see Yoon for doing this since he had no choice this time around due to his quest. Sell your friend. Basically, Doan has to deploy his party member, Si Yoon, to the crime scene of Mi Seong Dong to accomplish it. At first, a regular member of the group is supposed to show up so there shouldn't be any danger. Still, Doan keeps his distance to watch just in case. Much to his dismay, a moment of him looking away has gotten Si Yoon out of his sight. Meanwhile, the girl continues to endure her situation with Sun Moon, who introduces himself as Kim Ji Sung to her. Going round, they sit down to have a meal and get spotted by one of Moon's women. Afterwards, Si Yoon heads to a fortune teller with Moon and receives a dreaded jealousy card. It's a woman's prophecy, stating a sword filled with deep grudges will cut off your breath. The fortune teller then addresses Moon, showing him a card of fascination. The former says that the latter is overflowing with peach blossom luck and red flame luck, having a lot of women around him ever since he was young. Even though this sounds like a dream to some, the reality wasn't nearly as delightful for Sung Moon. At the time when he was a sixth grade student in elementary school, minding his own business alone, the poor boy gets sexually harassed by older girls on a daily basis. One day, one of the girls follows Moon home. As the young kid's parents always come home late, the girl takes advantage of being all alone and has her way with him. That was the moment when Moon first became interested in women. A twisted coping mechanism, or something else entirely, a flip got switched inside Moon. With a crazed look in his eyes, the sixth grader commands the older girl to lie down again. Now all grown up, Sun Mun brings the supposed minor Minji to a room cafe, basically a motel, all alone, receiving a call from Ma Jae Guk the buff vice representative of Mi Seong Dong. Jae Guk informs Moon that one of the tutors ran away and skipped today's class without saying a word, thinking that this might be a red flag. At the same time, Si Yun stands in the restroom, sighing. She wonders how long this will have to continue and braces herself for the setting. However, coming back into the room, Si Yun is confronted by a crazed woman, Teacher Kim. Her attempt to defuse the situation proves useless, as the maniac is consumed by a rage of jealousy. Why is no one normal? Swinging around a knife, the crazy tutor vows to kill the girl for seducing her boyfriend. Meanwhile, Do Wan receives a text from Si Yun about her whereabouts and arrives at the Secrets Room Cafe. Hearing about the runaway, Moon breaks up with her, leaving Jae Guk to punish the girl with the dreaded room. Over with Si Yun, the jealous girlfriend keeps swinging at her with a knife. Just as the Bora Maidong member is about to fight back, Moon enters the room and asks Kim what she is doing. Should we talk? mutters the Mi Seong Dong rep, dragging her out of the room to have a talk. Upon Moo's threat of a breakup, Kim falls to her knees and starts begging to him. Blinded by her loneliness and feelings of love, the girl refuses to live without him, tricking the poor lady with his sweet talk once again. Moon tells her to take some time off and have some rest, meeting back with him in a week by accepting the room reservation. Meanwhile, Do Wan runs around the motel. Despite checking each room and terrorizing every couple in his path, isn't able to find Si Yun anywhere, wondering where she went. In light of the recent incident, Moon wants to head to karaoke with Minji to lift up the mood. However, Si Yun thinks that this would just be a waste of time if they continued and wants to end this for today. Suddenly, Moon remarks that it's a shame since he wanted to introduce her as someone. Hearing this, Si Yun remembers the procedure whereby the underlings meet with the girls and take them to the Mi Seong Dong rep once they fulfill the criteria. Unaware that she is with Sun Moon himself, Si Yun decides to hang out a bit longer, informing Do Wan of the development. Oh no, not like this. Soon, the guy takes the girl to an abandoned and quiet karaoke room. As Si Yun wonders why the place is like that, Sun Moon suddenly asks her the reason why she came out today. Not buying that she is just lonely, the Mi Seong Dong rep snaps and wants her to tell the reason. Earlier, when Jae Guk called Sun Moon, he informed him that there is no record of the girl named Yeon Minji. He is currently within her school, though just in case she was embarrassed and simply used an alias, the deputy representative put her phone number through to the detective agency to see if it's on the bully council data. Lo and behold, there it was, a member of the Bora Maidong, Si Yun. Putting his arm around the girl's neck, Moon commends her bravery and takes her inside the room. He introduces Si Yun to a group of mass creeps, being the VIP guests of Mi Seong Dong. Closing the door behind her, Moon leaves the girl inside the camera-ridden room, announcing that she won't be alone anymore with them. Lock up these monsters, man. What the heck is wrong with them? Si Yun pulls out her taser and charges at the nasty freaks, getting disarmed and surrounded by the group instead. As the perverts get closer and closer to harass her, 
The girl gets scared. Right then. The door to the room slams open with a wild force, taking out one of the guys. An enraged Doan walks into the room, apologizing to Si Yun for being late. What have those perverts done to you? Questions the boy furiously, enveloped in his signature lightning aura. The end. For now.